right, I'm going to go ahead and get us started because we don't have a lot of time with our guest speaker today, and I want to maximize the time that we are able to learn from her wisdom. Uh, my name is Rachel Vaughn. I am the Executive Director for the Center for Leadership and Social Responsibility in the Milgard School of Business at UW-Tacoma. Um, sadly, I'm not physically located at UW Tacoma right now, but seeing so many lovely Tacoma and South Sound faces is making me feel like I was there. It is my absolute pleasure to um, share with you that today we have our first inspired speaker series of the year. And before I hand it over to Danny, who is the chair of our program development committee for the Milgard Women's Initiative, I just want to address a couple of housekeeping items. We will be going from 12.30 to 1.20 today. The event is being recorded. Um, and so you will have the opportunity if you haven't already to consent to that recording. At the end of our guest speaker's presentation, um, she will be taking questions. We have made the decision to disable the chat for this event because we're really excited for people to actually raise their hands, their physical hands, um, and be called upon for their questions to be answered. With that, I would like to turn it over to Danny Collins, who chairs the Program Development Committee for the Milgard Women's Initiative. And in that role, has helped us to develop this year's Inspired Speaker Series. Thank you very much, Danny. Thank you, Rachel, and welcome everyone. For those of you who aren't familiar, the Milgard's Women's Initiative advocates for all women. We are here to engage creative and innovative women throughout the South Sound in our organizations and build healthy communities. Um, the Inspired Speaker Series is one of the ways that we do that. And I am pleased and privileged to introduce my uh, one of my committee members um, and colleagues, Tara Doyle and King, who will introduce today's speaker. Thank you, Tara. Yes, thank you, Danny. Thank you. What a lucky day for us all. Debrina Jackson Gandy is a national best-selling author, master life coach, founder of Juicy Woman University, successful company owner of 25 years, founder of the Love Academy, and one of our very own Milgard Women's Initiative mentors. In addition, she is a world traveler, mother of three fabulous adult daughters and wife to an amazing husband of 27 years and counting. She is a firm believer in being the CDO, Chief Design Officer of your life. Yes, you can live life by your design. Whether it is through her nationally published best-selling books, her keynotes, courses, program, master classes, work with private coaching clients, or in her elite retreats, or whether it's when she's on a national TV show such as CNN, CNN Live, Good Day New York or Sister Circle, on podcasts, radio shows, Facebook or Instagram lives, or on TV shows as a recurring guest on Portland's Afternoon Live Show or Seattle New Day Northwest Show, she is all about creating new paradigms for living that are outside of the Western American culture confines and restrictive or limited thinking and are outside of imposed but false confines because she is a woman and because she is a black woman. Her life work is about introducing women to a new way of living and being that she calls the juicy woman lifestyle. It is characterized by more freedom, ease, peace, joy, and flow. Getting comfortable with stepping outside of the edges of the box and then living there are the results of possibility thinking. And it is available to all of us if we allow ourselves to go there. Today, we will go there and explore a new paradigm for experiencing a life of more ease and balance that is not based in trying to save, find, or manage time, but instead is about learning how to manage your energy. I've had the privilege of attending now four of Debrina's presentations. She will no doubt bring her dynamic energy and thoughtful insight to our lives today. So sit back, open your minds, take it all in, because you are about to be Debrinafied. Debrina Fi, thank you, Tara. <laughs> oh my goodness. Okay, can I use that? Debrina You may, you may. <laughs> <laughs> well, hello, everyone. Even if you're muted, you can wave your hands. Hello, good afternoon, good morning. Depending on what part of the country you're in, welcome, welcome, welcome. And I'm just so delighted to be back again, keynoting an awesome Milgard Women's Initiative sponsored and hosted event. And I just wanna say thank you so much to Rachel and to Maddie, to Anne-Marie, 
to Danny, um, those on the mentoring committee and also the program development committee that put my name forth as the winter inspired speaker. And Tara, thank you so much for introducing me once again. I think this is now our second time um, because you are doing an awesome job at the Puyallup Sumner Chamber of Commerce and you invited me to speak there. So it's always so great to have you set the tone. Um, so welcome, welcome. And in these next few minutes, everybody, we are gonna be talking about some new norms and some new possibilities and ways to have more ease. If anyone is interested in more ease, can you just flash your hands? That's gonna be your yes. Wonderful. If you are interested in more ease and more work-life balance, in our time today, I'm really going to be drawing from not only my lived experience, which is very important, so this is a theory or concept, but lived experience, and also my work over the last 20 years doing empowerment and transformation work with women really all across, not just the country, but also in different parts of the world. So I'm going to be drawing some th from things that you might find in my first national best-selling book, Sacred Pampering Principles, for those of you who may be familiar with that book, and also from my second national best-selling book, All the Joy You Can Stand. And these are principles I live by. They're what I teach in Juicy Woman University, and I have seen the profound difference that they can make in one's life. Now, I know we also have some men that are on the line, and I want to just let you know that this conversation is primarily uh, directed to women, but you can enjoy and learn right alongside um, and also receive some new insights that you might not have had before. Um, as Rachel mentioned, um, near the end of our call, um, the line will be opened up so you can raise your hand and ask a question and I'll have a chance to call on a few folks. So we hope to get some questions in before we're finished today. But I want to actually first confess that using the term work-life balance in the title is not my language. I don't talk about work-life balance, but I, I was agreeable to using that phrase in the title because I knew that was a phrase we were generally familiar with. And really my interest is not in balance, it's about us learning how to manage our energy differently. So as I talk about the keys to more ease, that is one of the things that you will hear me um, talk about because in the Western American culture, we do a lot of talking about time, saving time, don't waste time, finding time, making time. And I'm actually going to introduce a shift and a new framework to your thinking today called managing your energy. And what I have found is that living from that framework is what truly gives us more spaciousness and more ease. And then it allows us to line up our choices around our energy with what we claim are our priorities. And then this concept of work-life balance becomes secondary because it's about how you're managing your energy in the relationships that make up your life, including work, friends, et cetera. So I want to share just a little bit of background on how I even came to this body of work. And it really goes back to the days before I published my first national book, Sacred Pampering Principles. And at that time, I was freshly out of college. I had just moved from California where I went to school back here to Washington State. And when I was in California, I made some observations that really um, contradicted what I thought was gonna be the reality going to Southern California for school with all the sunshine and surf and beautiful people and beautiful bodies. I thought I was gonna be encountering some of the most sat deeply satisfied people on planet earth. But what I found was something very, very different that there was actually a lot of dissatisfaction, at least at that time, and a lot of complaint. And the question I posed to myself is, what are the keys to really living life with deep joy, deep peace, deep satisfaction, more ease, and more flow? And once I relocated back here to Seattle, I started paying even more close attention to how women were tending to live their lives and show up in their lives, especially if they had children, 
and especially if they were married. And I did not see deep joy. I did not see deep ease. I did not see deep flow. I saw a lot of depletion and overwhelm. And even before I got married and before I had my own children, I resolved that if I, if I chose to become a wife and if I chose to have children, that I was not gonna be in that same vein of a depleted, kind of worn out, frazzled woman. And so in what I'm sharing today is in my own exploration and experimenting with what are the beliefs that I can live from that will give me a different experience? What are the decisions and choices that I can make that will give me a different experience? And that's exactly what has happened. And it isn't personal to me because it's now been transferred through teachings and my classes and courses to literally thousands and thousands and thousands of women. So it's not personal to me. So what I share today is, is probably gonna even challenge some of the beliefs you've come to hold as true. Because you've, become to, because you've come to hold them as true doesn't mean they're truth. It just means it's what you understand at this moment. So some of that may be challenged, which is good because for us to talk about new possibilities, that means we have to become aware of the edges we've created in our lives. And then we have to go beyond them to what exists beyond those edges. And beliefs create edges and beliefs are changeable and beliefs are replaceable. Hallelujah. So as I am sharing, if there are some things I am saying that are resonating with you, one of the ways you can let me know feedback in the Zoom environment is to flash your hands. And I will consider that to be, Debrina, I am hearing you. Debrina, what you're saying is resonating. Debrina, what you are putting down, I am picking up, all right? So let me see the flash hands, just so I know we know how to do that. Give me some love back, yes. All right, y'all ready? Flash hands if you're ready. Are y'all ready? Are you ready? Okay. So I first wanna start by creating a little context and talking about the year 2020. Because yes, that was a year of a whole bunch of things, but that includes loss, that includes death. But I also consider 2020 a year of powerful reckoning and revelation, meaning that many things were revealed. It was a year for a reset. It is a year that was supposed to be and I hope it was a line of demarcation in our larger Western American culture, in our larger global community, and in each of our personal lives. Because so many things that we became comfortable with, dependent on, in our external focus, were taken away. And so there are some powerful lessons from 2020 that are part of this conversation tonight, this after this afternoon, because I've heard people say, I can't wait for things to get back to normal. We're supposed to go forward to a new possibility, not back to normal. And let me tell you why back to normal isn't such a glorious place to go to. Because if you look at the state of our hearts, our minds, our bodies, our relationships, a lot of breakdown was afoot. There was a lot of con contradiction and disjointedness between our public facing self and what may be going on in our private or personal lives. There was a lot of relationships that broke down, a lot of divorce that happened, frustrations um, soared, domestic violence increased, child abuse increased. We have the highest divorce rate of any country on the face of the earth out of 196 countries. We have the highest percentage of our citizens that are incarcerated. We have the highest homicide rates, the highest um, abuse of pharmaceutical drugs. We needed to cease in that same vein, creating those outcomes. We were focused on speed. We were focused on quantity, doing tasks, negative judgment, competition, comparison. That was pre-2020. 2020 was to draw a line to say there needs to be a new possibility that we collectively step into because many aspects of how we were living and many aspects of this culture 
or out of order. So with that said, that's what these new, the new norms and new possibilities I want to be sharing with you about are have that in the backdrop. That should have been a line of demarcation. I know for me in my business, the amount of activity, business activity I was engaged in and the number of hours in my business dropped. I, de I should say I decreased it down to 25% of what it usually was. 25%, yet my business grew 33%. So I can't go back to my old 100% because I saw that I could decrease my activity, increase my productivity, decrease my activity, increase my intentionality and my focus and have my business grow with fewer hours. So why would I wanna go back to that normal? I get to go forward to a new possibility. Like I can work fewer hours and yet generate more revenue and net profit, what? Let's stay with that new possibility. So I want to share with you uh, five, four keys. I think I might have time to get five in, but I want to share, uh, uh, leave time for questions. So I want to share with you um, four or five keys that I have found in my life make a huge difference in having an experience of more ease and work-life balance. And what I want to underscore is that so often in our culture, because we focus on behaviors and actions and not the beliefs informing the behaviors, that I'm giving you kind of a, a superficial, so to speak, um, introduction to this concept, because I'm mainly going to be talking about behaviors and we don't have time to actually look deeper to the cause level of behaviors, which is our beliefs. And you can't step into new paradigms and new possibilities without challenging your beliefs. So I'm gonna just put forth the, the inquiry for you all to inquire into what are the beliefs I've been holding about dot, dot, dot. And it can be about money. It can be about your energy. It can be about success. It can be about love. It can be about parenting and the list can go on and on, having a successful business. But most of us don't take time to actually explore our beliefs. So we're not doing that in this um, call, but it's something I really encourage you to do. We also have family beliefs that need to be challenged, cultural, Western American cultural beliefs. We talk about generational beliefs, but I've created a, a Debrinaism called generational beliefs that are being passed along through the female line in our families that may be restrictive or limiting that need to be challenged. So this is time for a belief upheaval and review. But for today, we're just gonna talk about some changes in behavior. So first of all, is you heard me mentioning a shift from managing time to now managing your energy. Debrina, what does that mean? So time, is more static and fixed. We all have 24 hours in a day and it's established by how long it takes for the earth to revolve once. I haven't found a 25th hour. If you find an extra one somewhere, please let me know. But all of us have 24 hours fixed and static of time. However, our energy is not fixed and static. It is a resource that can be renewed, can be increased, can be transformed, can be replenished, so when you're looking for more ease in your life, instead of focusing on a fixed static factor of time, shift over to now managing your energy, where the question becomes how and where and on what and with whom am I utilizing my energy? And am I utilizing it in ways that are creating forward motion and progress in my life? Am I utilizing my energy in ways that are bringing me joy and connecting me to my joy? Am I utilizing my energy in ways that my energy is reciprocated or is it one directional? Is any returning to me? So starting to shift to managing your energy has you ask yourself new questions before you engage in things. So you're not an autopilot, you're now asking yourself out of this framework of managing your energy, what and how and where and with whom am I utilizing it? And is it going to renew 
Is it going to be refilled? Is it going to be refueled, et cetera? And I promise you, you will say yes and no to new or different things when you shift out of the time construct to the framework of managing your energy. I can look at my calendar. Someone can ask, am I available to help with something on Saturday? And I may have the time available, but then I might have had an, an exceptionally full week and I'm looking forward to sleeping in, not having to leave the house, taking naps, taking a long bath. And now when I think of where my energy is going to be, I might say no to it. But if I just look at, do I have the time available? I might say yes. So when you start living your life from a framework of managing your energy and, and questioning the effect on your energy of engaging in or partaking in or in, at interacting with or saying yes to, your responses most likely will change. Managing your energy. Then the personal question that you want to ask is what refuels and refills my own energy? I am so committed in my life to having friendships that refuel, refill, and re are reciprocal, working with clients that do not deplete me because I can see the warning signs in the exploratory co co conversations. So I do not enter into client relationships or, or relationships with, with coaching clients or students in my courses where there's a depletion cycle. No, 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 no. So what refills and refuels me personally? And then it needs to be built into your life. Not treat it like a special event once I get through this really rough period. Then I'll, no, stop deferring. Build it into your life, okay? So that's one paradigm shift from managing your time or obsessing over trying to save and make time when it's a fixed static factor. Now move over to managing your energy as the framework and the questions that you now ask and pose before you engage and partake in things, okay? And if something is affecting your energy in a way that it's depleting it, then you look at what are the shifts that can be made to change the energy dynamic. Don't continue to partake when your energy is being depleted. It's a very valuable resource. Number two, you have two superpowers, every single one of us, that you get to more fully invoke when you shift to managing your energy and you up your commitment to more ease and balance in your life. And it's the superpowers of decision and choice. Decision and choice. So decision is what draws the line in the sand. And then the choices you make are aligned with your decisions. So for example, I had a friend over here at my home the other day. Um, as we come out of slowly out of COVID, I've been having people over one on one to just reconnect with friends live real time, six feet apart. You on one couch, me on the other one. And this particular friend of mine has been, I didn't know how long she had been dealing with an autoimmune disease. I thought it was just the last few years. It's been 20 years. And I said to her, are you ready to heal? And then she went into her frustration about all these years of the aches and the pains and the inconvenience of the disease. And I said, I heard that. And my question is, are you ready to heal? And ready to heal is a decision. Yes, I'm ready to heal. And then how do you know? Because your choices line up with the decision. And all of us have those two superpowers. No one can take that away from us. So you get to invoke that more fully and take a look at what you say is important to you and are your decisions and then your choices lined up with what you say is important. And unfortunately for many of us, and I've had this confirmed and reconfirmed, so this is not based upon theory or supposition, but after, um, hundreds of women coming through my Juicy Woman University program, 
it is very clear that so many of us have major gaps and contradictions and holes that what we say is important and then the decisions and choices we're making are not aligned. And when you have gaps between those two things, you lose personal power. It leaks like a leaky hose left on and the water is just pouring out. So one of the ways to up your personal power is you close the gaps where the power's leaking out, okay? So superpower of decision and choice. And it scared my friend half to death when I asked her that question. I could see it on her face because I wasn't just listening to the narrative about the pain and suffering from the disease, autoimmune, which I believe is reversible if it's autoimmune or degenerative. I said, are you ready to heal? I said, if you are ready to heal, get back to me because I do emotional forgiveness and healing work with people. And you've been having your body treated for this, but not doing the inner work. And so the notion that she could really heal, I think scared her half to death. I think she's begun to identify with the disease and life without it might be a new thing that scares the out of her. <laughs> so that's a second key to a life of more ease and balance is invoking more fully your superpowers of decision where a line is drawn in the sand and then the choices that result from support of that decision. And to take a look at where you need to make some decisions or where you've been avoiding making some decisions or you've made a decision based upon what you think will make other people happy, but you aren't. You are the center of your own life universe. You are the sun in your life universe and you wanna stay in the center. That's different than number one. I know I'm not, make, make yourself number one. No, I don't teach that. Put yourself back in the center of your life and stay there. And then everything else orbits around you. It works quite beautifully. <laughs> Everybody wins. Number three. Okay, this is where you can get off this phone and move into key number three immediately. And key number three is subtraction. What? The Western American culture only wants to add, 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 and more, 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 more. What? Debrina said subtraction. Yes. Yes. We need some subtraction in our lives. What am I talking about? We need to subtract a lot of the stuff for one. Because stuff holds energy and will deplete us. So too much stuff in your environment, too much stuff in your house, too much stuff in your car, too much stuff in your room, you'll be tired all the time. So some of us need to purge and subtract some stuff. Over last year during the shelter in place homestay, I decided I was gonna purge out all the, I have a paper, hold on to paper problem. I hang on to too many documents thinking one day I might need them again. Nine, garbage bags, huge glad garbage bags of shredded paper I hauled out of my office. I still had papers from nine years ago from a board I served on. Like when would I need that again? Notebooks when I was on the board of trustees. So what do you need to move out of your physical space? The literal stuff, okay? And that's actually one of the keys as well. So subtraction, so, I, so we need to learn, and this is especially to the, to the women on this line, how to say no without guilt. The without guilt's the key part. Because what is the guilt arising from? Some old beliefs, okay? So we're not doing the belief work right now, we're just looking at the behavior. So let me give you five ways to say no, because this will support subtraction, especially those of you who are wives and mothers. You really have to invoke the subtraction law, the subtraction key. So there's no, there's no thank you. There's I'll pass. There's that doesn't work for me. And that's when there's a negotiation you'd like to have. That doesn't work for me. Now you're going to counter offer with, with what does. Or the fifth way to say no, I have another commitment. 
to yourself, to your well being, to your energy, to your sacred self care. They don't need to know that part. I have another commitment. Five ways to say, I'm not going to partake in that. No, no, thank you. I'll pass. That doesn't work for me. I have another commitment. So there are some of us on this line that need to invoke those forms of no beginning yesterday. And that includes to friends. Then this is a biggie for women, especially is to learn how to make requests. This is all part of the subtraction because some of us need to offload some stuff. Okay, we got to offload some stuff. You might need to bow out and complete some responsibilities. I remember several years ago, I was on three different boards and I attended a women's conference with one of my uh, mentees that invited me to join her. And I was in a, in a session where the seminar leader said, list all the things you're involved in right now. And I'm looking at these three, no, four boards. Oh my gosh, four boards I was on. And I went through each one and said, which one am I still lit up and lighted up about? And the energy is reciprocal. <clears throat> That's the ones I'm gonna stay on. And the other ones, when I get back home, I'm gonna graciously announce my transition out. And that's what I did. I subtracted that, those two things. So sometimes we need to subtract from some things we're involved in and we need to go and check to see, oh, what effect is this having on my energy? Does it energize me? Do I look forward to it? Do I have a little bit of a pit in my stomach knowing the meetings today? Or do I get excited? You ask yourself those questions. We do not have to have our lives filled with, th filled with things we're just tolerating. So, let me tell you, ladies on the line, how to make requests. Now you may say, Debrina, I know how to make requests. That's what we always say. And when I ask women to say what they're, share what they're saying with me, it's not requests. So especially those of you that are married, especially not only, especially those of you that are married, you got to learn how to make requests because we are carrying way too much of the load at home when both parents are working. Women too often act like they were, they're single parents and they're, they have um, inordinate responsibility or extra responsibility for the children they co-created with another human. Knock that off. Be a co-parent, stop acting like the only parent. Come on now, right, Monique? Come on now, yes. Flash some hands if there's some truth you're hearing here. So here's how you make a request. There's a certain form of making a request. And in our communication as women, we don't make requests. We drop hints, we're indirect, we infer, we assume. We don't make direct requests. So this is a new muscle. But if you're dealing with men in your life, coworkers, employees, boyfriends, spouse, br adult brother, whatever, you wanna learn how to make requests because males understand requests. So here you go. You start with the word, would you? Or will you? Why do I have to be specific? Because we will tend to say, can you? Do you think you can? No. Will you or would you? I was just speaking to one of the students in Juicy Woman University the other day who was very frustrated in her marriage. And I said to her, did you, did you make a request? And I was talking about her husband. She goes, I've already done that. I've done that so many times. I'm just so tired of asking. Uh, I said, okay, share with me what you said this morning that had to do with the grocery store. And she says, I need you to go to the store, da, 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 because I need to study for a course. I said, that's not a request. That's a statement. She swore she'd already asked him. I said, women that say they're asking and making requests and they're making statements. It starts with, will you or would you? And then there's an action and then there's a question mark on the end. When you put forth a request, the other person has the space to say yes or to say no. If they say no, then come back with another request or put the request forth to somebody else. 
but you continuing to do and take on or they won't do it, I'll go ahead and do it. No, that's old behavior. Leave that on the other side of 2020. Right, Tilly? The other, leave that on the other side of 2020. <sighs> so there's some retraining that may be involved as well. If you've been doing way too much for other people, let me say it again. If you've been doing way too much for other people, They've gotten used to it. They've gotten accustomed to it. And when you shift, they might experience a little bump of inconvenience and you may get a little pushback. That's human. Take your stand. They will adjust. Let me say that again. They will adjust. <laughs> So if you have not been honoring your energy, notice I didn't say boundaries. I said honoring your energy. And if you've not been honoring yourself and your energy and you start to upgrade your attention to that, you'll become painfully aware of how much you've been dishonoring that because folks are going to still be engaging with you based upon your old MO. Again, I was talking to the same student, this one that was very frustrated. And she was saying that every time she tries to study for this course, she gets interrupted by her sons or her husband. And at that very moment, while we're on our Zoom meeting, her husband comes in and starts to talk with her. And she said, I'm in a meeting. And he continued to talk about like some cereal or something, very insignificant and then went out and I just started to laugh. I said, this is a comic relief moment because the very thing you're talking about just happened live real time. I said, now, what are your options? She goes, I don't know, I don't know. So she was starting to feel powerless because she had been in this pattern, participating in this pattern for so long. I said, really simple. Either after we get off this call, you go and let him know, don't do that again. That did not work and how he should uh, proceed in the future. Or you could have muted me out and called his name really loud to interrupt his, his, his going on about the cereal and saying, I will talk with you afterwards. I don't appreciate the interruption. I said, or you can study somewhere offsite. Go to a coffee shop, go to a restaurant. You got all kinds of options, but to sit there and let him interrupt you, that's what you chose in the moment. So she, has a decision to make about how she's been showing up in her marriage, not just complain about her frustration with her husband's response to how she's been showing up in her marriage. So, and that was creating stress in her life. So when she takes a stand for herself and brings her voice forward, she's going to have more ease in other areas of her life too, because she's doing way too much at home. She's not feeling appreciated in her marriage. She has a lot of power as the chief design officer of her life to create a shift. And then the fourth key, I already snuck the fourth key in earlier when I talked about purging. One of the things that absolutely I think should have happened in 2020 is those projects that we kept saying we were going to get to and should get to were gotten to. And a lot of those projects had to do, projects had to do with cleaning stuff out. So I invite you to select an area, start where you can have success. So don't say the garage when you know that's a three week project, but maybe your purse, maybe your wallet, maybe under your bed. Maybe a guest room closet if you have a guest room. Maybe a section of your closet. Maybe a drawer. Start small and be victorious in purging. And I didn't say organize, that's different. Keep the same stuff and stack it neatly. I didn't say organize. Purging means you subtract the amount and quantity of stuff, okay? Hey, Patricia. <laughs> So the, fit, the fourth key is purge. Where can you start in your personal life? Start someplace where you can be victorious. It's not dependent on anybody else. Don't start with something for the kids or the 
husband or the friend. Start with something in your personal life, like your wallet, like your purse. Clean out the gum wrappers, the coins floating around, the receipts sticking out of the, out of the wallet. If it can't clasp because it's so full, clean some stuff out. Maybe one of your drawers. Okay, that's going to free up some energy. Seems like there wouldn't be a relationship between our outer world and our inner world, but there is. So I hope everyone has heard in these keys to experiencing more ease and balance, some things that you can begin to attend to even once you are off this call. And again, these things are not theoretical. They're not conceptual. I didn't read them in someone else's book and say, I think they work. No, these have been tested and tried over and over again for many, 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 many years with thousands of women. And of course, my wife, my life is the number one guinea pig laboratory life. I try everything first in my own life. So again, we're not dealing with beliefs because that's a whole nother powerful arena of conversation. We're just dealing with some behaviors and some communication patterns that you can change right now that will make a difference. And what are the requests that you need to make, especially if you are a married woman and you know you've been taking on way too much around the house, what are the requests you need to make or what is a request to make to your spouse? For those of you who have children that are four or older, your kids should be doing chores. That is my belief. And I don't just mean cleaning up behind themselves. Chores mean you're contributing to the household because you cannot pay the mortgage or rent. And it needs to be age appropriate. I'm encountering too many parents. This is a side note. This is just a brainless passion coming out. I'm encountering too many parents whose kids don't have chores. And the kids are like eight, nine, 10, 11. what? Chores are healthy. So children can contribute to a household and they need to be checked and inspected. If you have them do chores, teach them excellence by checking and inspecting it. And then congratulating them when they do a well done job and giving them feedback, not criticism, but feedback on how they need to tighten it up. And when they tighten it up, congratulate them for tightening it up and that be the standard for their chores. All right, so with that y'all, I wanna take a few minutes for, I think we have about four minutes for questions and then I know students have to go to class, but if there's anything and what I have shared that you have heard that for you was relevant and it resonated. Can I see some hands if there's anything you heard? Wonderful. So now I have time for a couple questions and there's a lot of wonderful people on the line, like 50 people, but I'm gonna, I have time for a couple of questions. So you get to stay muted and raise your physical hand. And then I'm gonna say your name if I'm calling on you for the question and then you can unmute. Okay, we have a lot of wonderful people. I need to look at both screens. So I have time for two questions. Raise your physical hand. That means you have to show up on your screen for a hot minute. And then you get to ask your actual question with your own mouth. You're not gonna type it. Questions, questions. I see Dr. Page has a question. Is there also a second one? Okay, we'll start with you, Dr. Page. So great, you're unmuted. Hello, good to see you. Hello, thank you so much for being here. I know you don't want to go into the belief side, but the path towards the beliefs, could you speak to that? Is it, as we start changing those behaviors, it shifts our beliefs? Is that part of it? What, What do you... So, so a change in behaviors don't shift beliefs. They just change behaviors. Then you have to keep willing the behavior. If you actually deal with the root of the behavior, the belief, then there's ease because beliefs will always look to be made right and they will always prevail. We don't usually do level work at the belief level. That's why we're also gritting our teeth, efforting through making change. We never dealt with the root system of the behavior. But the behavior can achieve some results. But if you want to really get to the root cause so you don't regress, you deal with the beliefs. So choose an area of your life. If you, if you want to start to uncover 
um, what beliefs are afoot. For example, my third book is called The Love Lies. And I have a whole section in here for women so they can start to dig up the beliefs they're holding about love and men and how you engage and how you show up and what works. Because the American model is a inherently failing model and it's been failing and it's working perfectly producing 51% divorce in at least in the marriage arena. We keep following a failed model. So I give women some exercises. Well, first of all, choose an area of life Zero in, it can be money, let's say money, or men, or your body. And you write down what's been occurring. So like a reporter watching a scene, they're just reporting on what they see. There's no judgment, it's not good or bad. There's no criticism, oh my God, how could you? There's just, here's what's been happening with relation to my body. Here's my experience in my life with money. And you just write it down first of all, okay? That's so you can objectively see what the dynamics and patterns have been. Then you ask yourself the question, so if this is what's been showing up for real in my life around this area, what might the beliefs be that would correlate to these things showing up and this experience showing up? Now, not reasons, beliefs are not reasons. Beliefs are not rationales. And we're so used to reasons and explanations that I usually have to work with women for a long time to get them away from just reasons to the actual truths you're operating from, even though they're false. So with my student who has had many years of certain dynamics in her marriage she says she doesn't feel appreciated she says she she says she feels disrespected and i watched a disrespectful act occur while i was the one on the zoom call but she was allowing it and it was permissible and i just happened to be observing what's been happening you see now for her to be participating in a space where she's being disrespected, there has to be some subconscious belief she's holding or set of beliefs that's congruent with what's showing up. Her level, level of self-love has to be at a place, there's levels of self-love. We always say, do you love yourself or not? No, there's levels of self-love. Her level of self-love is low and it needs to be upgraded because at higher levels of self-love, disrespect can exist in the same space. So there's some beliefs that she's holding that are showing up in how she's dancing in her marriage and engaging and relating and what's being allowed and what's being permissible in her space. You see? But that can be with any area of our lives. That's just one example. Transformation is based on doing the belief work. So I'm not just personal growth and self-awareness. No, I want transformation, new creature, caterpillar to butterfly. When you do belief work, caterpillar to butterfly can happen, but you are the butterfly. So great question. So any of us can do that work. It just requires sitting ourselves down, getting out a piece of paper, zeroing in on a specific area of life, particularly where we want to break through or we want to elevate to a higher level and say, what's been occurring? What's been happening? What have the patterns been? And then what might the beliefs be that would correlate to and be congruent with those experiences showing up? Then there's work you do once you've actually excavated your beliefs, but really that's the first part. You don't have anything you to work on if you haven't even identified what beliefs are running your life because our beliefs run our lives, not us. We think we do. Our beliefs are running our lives. So with that, I think the students are going to have to go to class. Um, in the chat, if you all will turn that back on, I'm glad to um, have the university provide my contact information. 
And I just want to turn it back over to, I don't know if I'm turning it back over, oh, to Miss Rachel. I just thank you all so much for being with us. Thank you to the University of Washington, Tacoma campus, University of Washington, the Center for Leadership or Center Leadership and Social Responsibility, right? Yes, for um, making this available. Thank all of you. I thank all of you for taking time out of your day. And now I want you to actually move into action, not just hear it, but now execute. So Rachel, back to you. Thank you so much. Mwah. applause for Debrina. Oh my gosh. I was so struck Debrina by the phrase, if you can't clasp it, it because it's too full, it's time to clean it out. And I thought that was an absolutely great description, not just of a purse, but of our lives. Woo! So thank you so thank much you. for being with us today, Debrina. Debrina's contact info is in the chat. I hope you all have a wonderful afternoon and are able to take action on at least one thing today. Um, and we look forward to seeing you at the next Inspired Speaker Series event during spring quarter. We'll be releasing more information about that in the coming weeks. And in the meantime, a big thanks to Danny and the Program Development Committee and Tara for all of the work that went into making this happen today, as well as Anne-Marie Martin, who of course, did a tremendous amount of work behind the scenes to promote this event. So thank you all and enjoy your afternoon. Bye-bye.